says, this is really hard, we don't know how to do it, but I can go around the problem a different way. And the way I'm going to do the problem is I'm going to use micro data because when an individual makes a decision about consumption, if I have individual consumption diary data, an individual is going to be taking prices as fixed because that individual is not going to be able to take effect prices. So when we see them facing two, diff two different people who are otherwise the same, facing different prices in different markets, we can deduce from that, and they have different consumptions. If they have the same elasticity and there's no fixed effects and all that stuff, we can deduce from that what the elasticity of demand is going to be. And so this was a big insight, and uh, although Pigou had been the first to use diary data, he didn't use it in the context of the identification problem, but the big aims of statistics and, and early econometrics were right there on this. So Ragnar Frisch, uh, Irving Fisher, Rene Roy, remember Roy's identity? Uh, Jacob Marshak, these guys all said the solution to the identification problem is to use is to use microdata. So we think about using microdata today. That's where this is where it comes from. Okay. Problem three: adopt a recursive system. So what Moore Moore actually, you know, to his credit, took this to heart. Even though he was being called a fool, he said, "I get it. Okay, I understand the point." But what he said is, "I know something about agricultural commodities, which is that." Um, when I, uh, when, is, uh, I know something, this is how they wrote it down, but let me just tell the words. Basically, to exogenize something. And the way you can exogenize something is you can, you can set, um, I actually get one more typo. I'm sorry I screwed up on this. I've got my, I've got my timing wrong. This is a quantity and this is a price. I'm sorry, sorry about the typos. Basically, here's the deal. Uh, agricultural commodities, if I'm a farmer, um, I'm going to decide in the spring about how much to plant. And so, uh, so my decision on the spring isn't going to be based on the price I'm going to get for that good this coming fall. It's going to be maybe based on last, last fall's price. But if I make my planning decision in the spring based on last fall's price, and then I produce my goods, and then I bring it to market, and then the price this fall is determined based on the quantity that I deliver, then what I've done is essentially got a recursive system where instead now price is determined by, by quantity. The supply involves last year's price, and so I've developed a recursive system where I've exogenized, I've exogenized price uh, for the supply curve, and then I've exogenized quantity for the demand curve. So, um, so that's his method, and in fact, you know, if you think about time series econometrics, that's a method that we've seen continued on through the ages uh, in, in, a, in an important way. Uh, and it wasn't really until the Rational Expectations Revolution and even Sims' article of 1980 where there was a full-blown attack on this where they would then answer, the answer would be, yeah, but that farmer is not just looking at last year's price, but probably thinking about the price that, that, farm, that he's going to get um, this coming fall. And if you replace last year's price with expected price in the fall, then you have a Rational Expectation System. And the problems of this, uh, or the problems of this recursive system, uh, 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 come 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 full full uh, come to bear. But it's it's a it's a it's a it's a completely logically sound answer to this question. Another logically sound answer to this question is basically going back to the Keteris Paribus assumption and forcing demand to be held constant. And so this is something that, in Philip Wright's words, are based adjustments to the data that are based on intimate knowledge. And when I say it that way, this sounds completely mysterious. How in the world can you do adjustments to the data based on intimate knowledge? What does that mean? Let me show you what this means. Suppose that um, you have a latent quantity, uh, so we have a latent, um, a latent demand uh, system where uh, we don't actually measure quantity, but we measure quantity with some error term and it's independent error. And then suppose it's the case further that um, the demand system depends on price and then on um, some other variables W. If we observe all of these flows, I'm first of all just going to substitute quantity, uh, I'm going to substitute this equation into this equation, uh, this equation into this equation, and then this would be the uh, and then this would be the uh, uh, equation for what we actually observe, and um, and uh, and then the point is that. Uh, there's, by being able to observe all of these W shifters, we no longer have any error in the demand curve. So what we are effectively doing is holding the demand curve constant so that all of the movements are going to be along the supply curve. And so, uh, so there's two ways to do that. One is if you can obtain all of the demand shifters, then you can put them in a regression and you can run that regression. And the other opportunity, the other thing you can do 
is you, if you happen to know what those demand shifters were and you knew what the coefficient on those demand shifters were, you could construct an adjusted version of quantity and regress it against price, and that would be a legitimate, uh, legitimate regression. And it's interesting, this is actually an important thing that people did, and what it leads to is it leads to a problematic argument. And the problematic argument is that the higher your R squared, the better your, the more likely you can deduce that it's causal. Because it's a, if you've got more W's in there, it's a higher R squared, it says you're closer to holding constant demand. And that fundamental logical flaw was something that Philip understood, but really wasn't widely understood at the time. So there's a lot of, of this literature that is basically trumpeting I um, are squares and using that as, as where you actually have really uh, correct demand. I'm going to skip over the frisch waugh theorem, which is related to that in the interest of time. But the final contribution is instrumental variables regression. And that's what Philip uh, has uh, published in his 1928 Appendix B article. I'm not going to say anything about the 1928 work because Carrie's going to talk about that in more detail, but I do want to say just one or two quick words about IV regression in the 1930s and 40s and what happened to Phillips' um, path-breaking contribution, or more precisely, what didn't happen. Um, so there's some question in the literature uh, of attribution as to whether this was also, this concept of IV regression was also uh, invented by Kinberg. Um, and I have read this article a lot. I've read this several times, and I have to say, it, some people claim that, uh, that this article introduces what's called the indirectly squares or reduced form solution to the instrument, to the identification problem. I just don't see that. I don't see those equations in there. Uh, I, I see some words that could be interpreted as that, but I don't see the math. Um, and actually, Tim Bergen admitted that he didn't really solve the problem. So I think that that's not a, a correct attribution. I think the first attribution for instrumental variables post um, right is 1941, Rearsall's work on uh, instrumental variable estimation in the context of confluence analysis. And there he had one instrument. Uh, this uh, concept of instrumental variables was it took a while to extend to multiple instruments. It was first done in the context of the Coles Commission in what's called Limited Information Maximum Likelihood by Anderson and Rubin in 1949. And it wasn't until 1953 that two-stage least squares was invented. My understanding is that these three papers were all independent, and I think that it's credible that they were. Tile actually invented two-stage least squares, but published them in some incredibly obscure uh, thing in French that was a publication of the, some French planning bureau. And, it, uh, and nobody knew about this stuff. Uh, so Baseman and Sargon uh, independently invented two-stage least squares. And it's interesting to look at Sargon's 1958 paper in terms of his attributions. So his opening line was a econometric kind of paper in 1958 is the use of IV, the instrumental variables, was first suggested by Rearsaw. So that's that 1941 paper for the case of economic variables subjected to exact relationships. And then he goes on to extend it in this paper to dynamic systems. And, and in this paper, he invents two stage least squares independently with Baseman and independently with Tile. So um, the contribution by Wright had at this point just essentially been lost to time. And these guys just didn't know about it, uh, which is really a pity. Uh, we'll learn a little bit about why that was uh, in, in just a minute. Um, I want to say I'm doing my bit. Uh, so this is um, this is a this is taken from the third edition of our undergraduate textbook, and so we have our bit in here about Philip Wright and Sewell Wright, and based on what we've uh, learned, what Carrie has learned recently, I think we're going to need to do a little bit of editing on this.
It's also connected to the Oxford Center, so that's another connection with our president. Uh, and um, uh, for the senior stu students here, Tafra here, you should know that this is uh, the work that Karen is going to present as part of our senior thesis. And look, it's October 3rd, and she's almost done. With this. <laughs> So we will learn um, uh, from, from Kerry uh, about Kilbride uh, Institute and the discovery of instrumental variables for questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, So, um, as was said, this is part of my research throughout the year, and I started it a while back last spring um, for, because of the fortunate incident that Betty Rose uh, gave us papers that Sewell and Philip Wright exchanged between each other in 1926, which was two years before Appendix B was published, um, which is the first incident of insurance variable regression. Um, so, to quickly kind of go over the players in this, I know we've heard about them. But Philip Wright, I mean, he was here at Tufts, it's very much a local story. He was down the road in 1887 at Harvard getting a degree in, in economics. Um, and I mean, he was an academic through and through. He moved his family to Illinois so he could teach at Lumber College, where he would teach school mathematics, um, which keep that in mind for later in the letters. And then he would move in 1912 back to Massachusetts with school when he started his master's work in, in biology at Harvard. Um, there he worked under Professor Tossig, who did a lot of work with tariffs, um, which is also very important to our story. Um, he then moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, to join the U.S. Tariff Commission when Tossig moved, and then um, lived in Washington and worked at the Institute of Economics for some time when he really made his career. Um, and this is totally because I've been reading their letters for months now. I just wanted to get a sense of his handwriting, so take whatever characteristics you will, but this is Sewell's hand, and I've gotten to know him well. Um, so, oh sorry, Philip's hand, sorry, Philip's hand right there, keep that in mind. So Sewell, um, as the president said earlier, is a famous geneticist, he studied under his father, as I said, and he went to Harvard and learned about biology there, where he actually had a very large lab of guinea pigs, which is interesting, you just picture him with all the guinea pigs studying their reproductive nature, just him with all these animals, would be great. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense, he moved to the University of Chicago in 1925, and this is exactly when the letters were written. Um, so that was definitely a change for the Wright family as Sewell moved across the country, his father moved down to D.C., and they were no longer in close proximity. Um, and this is uh, Sewell's handwriting. A little bit harder to read than Phillips, and uh, whatever characteristic trait you want to take from, I'm happy. Um, and here's the right family, because I just want to stress this is really a this is really a story about a family and it just it just plays out great. Okay. So inventing IV regression. I mean Professor Stock just talked about this big breakthrough. They were the fifth solution to the identification problem. Um, and it's just to estimate coefficients on an endogenous variable. And in Appendix B of his 1928 book, The Tariff on Animal and Vegetable Oils, Phil Wright publishes this. And I want to stress this book is not a book about methods of statistics. It's a very thick book about exactly that, animal and vegetable oils. And I don't know if you've ever read a book about that, but <laughs> it's hard. So you can kind of almost understand where, why this kind of got lost. Um, so yeah. So we have, we have this question first of who authored Appendix B, and this was a historical question that Professor Stock and um, Trevi looked at in 2003, and it was cited that Sewell had just written it, and Philip had just inserted it into the back of his book because I guess Sewell couldn't figure out a way to publish it in uh, the minds of those who said it, and that, that's just false. We did a style metric analysis, and, which is the analysis that was made famous by the Federalist Papers to determine Madison or Hamilton wrote them, and it's clear that Philip wrote the actual text for Appendix B. But even still, people said, even if he authored it, it must have been Sewell's book. Who was responsible for the main of this? So I make the case for Philip. He authored Appendix B, he was deeply invested in the question, it was vital to his work in his time, and he had also had a deep understanding of the identification problem. But at the same time, the case for Sewell is appealing. 
He was a statistical mastermind. He had published a paper in 1921 called Correlation and Causation that laid out this, me this method called path analysis, which just drew from one variable, you can draw a straight line with an arrow um, pointing to a causal, a causal outcome, and you can assign correlations. And from that, you can draw several different lines, and I'll show you these diagrams. And you can come up with the equations that you need. And as Professor Stock said, he also published a paper in 1925 on coordinate cycles. And although he had kind of ignored the identification problem, I mean, he could have come back and figured it out within a year, right? It was on his mind also. Um, but I, through reading these letters and through really understanding their ideas, they're just, there's just one word that I think really just sums up, like this was absolutely collaborative. There was no way one could have done it without the other, and over the next time or so, I'm going to try to prove that. Um, so moving forward, I wanted to start with the diagrams that were in the letters from, from Sewell to Philip and what they looked like. So right here you see this first diagram. You have two factors pointing to demand and supply, and they're affecting price and output. And you can see all these arrows going across. And these, this P1, P2, O1, O2, those are what are called path coefficients. And the idea is these are correlations. Um, and then you can trace, trace these, these different variables to their outcomes, and you can come up with an equation. Um, this type of framework was, was then it was used in other parts of academics, but not quite in the way of tracing, tracing equations back from it. Um, so I'll just go through a basic, a basic quick kind of summary. So if you have A and it's causing X, in path analysis you would say X equals little a, which is the path coefficient, times big A plus some error. And what he's done here is he's standardized, he's standardized A and X. And he's saying that standard deviation of x is 1 and standard deviation of a is 1. So really, the path is just the correlation between the two. And this is real add value of path analysis. All you needed to have were the correlations. Or, or you just had the path and you could solve through correlations based, based, on their, um, based on their proximity to each other. And in modern notation, we have this, this um, estimated beta is the estimated a times the ratio of your standard deviations. And this, as you, as you play out the mathematics, comes up with this, this bottom back, this bottom equation here. These are basically saying the same thing, but they're no longer standard. They, in modern notation, it's no longer the standard deviations that are standardized, are equal to one. Um, so the question is, where did these paths come from? And this was outside of the scope of the letters, but if you dive into, into Sewell's 1921 paper, he comes up with a diagram, oh, like on a diagram on the left, which is very similar to the diagrams he writes to Philip in 1926. And you'll notice these are only these are exactly the same as B is missing in the, the letter, but they're they're saying almost the same thing. So the question is, why didn't Sewell just come up with this in 1921 and then apply this to his 1925 hog cycle paper? And the answer is he, he had He'd come up with this as a ideological framework, but he had never solved for it. It was rather an exercise in his paper to teach you how to think about how these different paths worked. And he got, and so he was trying to determine birth weights of guinea pigs, and he would, he would get rid of the, the Y, and he would just show you this different path. And it wasn't until Philip asked, and that's key, it wasn't until Philip asked that Sewell solved these. So the question, is in the, the answer to this issue wasn't independent of Philip at all. It was because of Philip, because Philip asked. But Philip really did need Sewell's help to solve this. So this is what Sewell comes up with for the equation to estimate elasticity with these A's and B's. And you can see here, just as in the modern form of I regression, A is only correlated with D. It's exclusively exclusive to D, and B is only exclusive to S. So he comes up with this equation through this path analysis, where I'll spare you the derivation. And what's really interesting is that Philip writes back, I expect I am stupid, but I don't seem to be able to pick up a new branch of mathematics or quickly as I once could. And this is just really ironic because Philip had been Sewell's math and calculus teacher in college. He was a very well-versed man in this, but this, this method of path coefficients was just so kind of
hard to understand or convoluted of sorts, and I totally understand where Philip was coming from after reading all these papers. And, and Philip really is at a loss, and he says, yes, if that is the equation, and it works, like I've, I've, used, like I've used it for a known value, and it works. But I just have no idea how to do it myself. Um, so he responds with this. And this is really remarkable. And he says, I've worked out for you, for your math, of estimated supply and demand curves without reference to the theory of path coefficients. And he independently derives the IV regress rate. You can see this right here. He goes through, he has the supply curve and demand curve. And he's multiplying the elasticity times price equals the difference between output and O and S, where here is the supply. And he multiplies through an A. And it's an A which is uncorrelated with S. And that's the key. He really understood this. And he comes up with this estimator, which looks, I mean, very similar to the one Professor Stock showed us earlier. And he goes, I discovered it by a singularly roundabout process. I'm trying not to insult his son. Because I'm sorry, I don't get your path analysis, but I just kind of figured this out. Um, so they have now two within these, within, by March of 1926, they have two independent derivations of the IV regressor. And he even thinks about introducing error, which is interesting. He goes, I should suppose with a finite number of observations, some EAS would be seldom, so A is sort of uncorrelated with S, seldom be precisely zero. And he basically just asks, Sewell, do you know how to do this? Sewell goes, no. So they just leave it out, which is, I guess, fine. But they had the insight. They really understood this. So he goes to testing his method. And this is where things get interesting from a modern perspective. So he does a simulation, basically a one draw one to simulation, where he has no elasticities, and he tests his method, and it works. And he writes to Sewell, it works. But then on March 15th, he is trying to find the elasticity, elasticity of demand for sprint wheat. And he finds an elasticity of negative 0.88 using per, uh, building permits of the instrument. But he concludes it's an obvious absurd, it's a result obviously absurd. And here I am, I'm reading this, I'm saying, why is that absurd? He got the sign right, isn't that the first step? <laughs> so the sign is right, but he must have known something that 0.88 was, must have just been, and I was thinking, oh, spring wheat, definitely going to be in, inelastic. He's totally right. But he must have known something. So if you test up, oh, so it, I'll just talk about the data quickly. Um, he had real price, and he used this so he could standardize wheat output in millions of bushels, and then several different variables here that I'll come back to. And he uses deviations of data from a straight line. So if you do this test today, you get a coefficient of negative 0.72, which is kind of pretty close to his 0.88. I mean, he was doing this by hand, so we'll, we'll give that a, we'll give, say that's pretty close. And he uses the instrument with building permits. But the first stage F statistic is only 1.31. So by modern standards, this was a weak, a weak instrument. But he knows that, which is amazing. He goes, in the case of any specific commodity, is it even possible to find factors which have such distinct cause relationships with output or demand conditions? He asks Sulis. He goes, such factors, I fear, especially in the case of demand conditions, are not easy to find. And what kills me, and he must have realized this at some point, is he had another variable right there the whole time, which he would have used. Rainfall. It, and I'm guessing if he thought it was too high, this is a really good outcome. He gets, he gets negative 0.48 for the coefficient. That's what he would have gotten if he had run this. And the F statistic is 12.66. So it's, a, it's not a weak instrument by modern standards. So he had it right in front of him. And I suspect he figures this out with this data. He never publishes anything with this data. This is really the first time he puts his, puts his equations to the test. And with a little bit more historical gap work, I think I'll be able to conclude pretty soon that rainfall would have been the first instrument used in IV regression, which is, which is interesting. Um, so here's the question. Where did these additional factors come from in terms of he had several different factors? It wasn't just building permits, it was building permits and rainfall, and he had other ones too. He had the ratio of spring wheat to flaxseed um, output and all these different things. And you can see that this is a this is a, a diagram that Sewell sends him. And there are now several different factors. There are several different arrows 
affecting the supply situation alone, and several different arrows affecting the demand situation alone. So it's not just one variable they were thinking about. They were thinking about several. And there you, it's the ideological groundwork for two-stage least squares, if you really think about it. He's, have, he's saying, we have several factors that are going to affect demand, if demand is going to affect price and output. And he has, it's, it's just all right there. It's way before the times and way before the, the thinking that was going on. But the kind of, the sad part is they never solved for it. They never solved this equation to come up with two stage least squares. So that's on my to-do list. So path analysis equations. Um, so continuing, kind of want to recapitulate so far what we have. So Philip and Sewell have been writing to each other, and Sewell introduces this idea of additional factors. So that's the instrument. That's the basic. Then they both separately come up with a derivation for, for the IV estimator. And then they have this ideological framework for two-stage least squares, which is also amazing they were thinking of it. He did a first job on Carl simulation. He did an empirical application. And he had further discussed weak variables. So the question is, it's 1926. You know, I'm, Sewell's in Chicago, Phillips in DC, and they say, what next? And now you think of their ties, right? They, they have ties to some pretty important schools and places. So, Philip writes that he was in Cambridge, and he says, I spoke to Dr. Tossing about my study of supply and demand curves, and he suggested that I prepare an article for the quarterly. I hope I can handle it, as to do justice to your analysis. I think, it will be, I think it will prove the most valuable part. And this was even before, this was before now, um, Philip's own derivation. This is in February of 1926. So remember, Phillips was in March. And what happens? Is really So, and this is, I mean, this is just the really focus of my next research. Like, I don't know if they burned this or what, but it was rejected. And it was rejected despite tossing, suggesting he write it, and despite all of the amazing things I just told him about it. And tossing with the other time. I mean, that's really, I mean, I just don't even know. I just don't even know how that is. But, so, the question, the question really is, or my question is, why wasn't this accepted? And, I mean, he puts this in his work, in his 1928 work, and you can kind of see he knew it was important. He understood the identification problem. So he sticks it in, appen in an appendix of his book that no one will read because it's really just, I mean, it's about vegetable and animal oil tariffs. Um, and they have two derivations, and he presents his own algebraic derivation first, and he, he supports it with Sewell's path analysis derivation. But it's, it's really, a question of the kind of economic landscape of the time. I mean, Philip clearly was a very academic man. He taught his entire life and was doing research at the Institute of Economics. But it, it's maybe to do with this kind of economic aristocracy that existed at the time. And you see it, or you've seen that Philip's ideas weren't exactly greeted to the economic community. I mean, people resisted his even early ideas, his 1915 ideas of the identification problem. Um, and it's not until it's independently kind of reinvented that that instrumental variable regression is used again. So it's it's really a, it's just a story that is that really sums up you know this collaborative work between a father and son. And Philip writes to Sewell with all your anxiety 